Lord, we ask that as we move forward with this service, that your will be done, that your praise is heard, and that you see the outpouring of our heart in love to you, Lord. God, we love you, and we thank you, and we praise you, Lord. You are so good, Father, and we know that you do so much for us, Lord. We want to honor you this morning. We want to worship you with truth, and we want our hearts to reflect your heart this morning, God. Help our eyes to be open, our hearts to be receptive, and let us be changed from glory to glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Here we are, God, 
shake our nation. All we need is your love, you Captain Fame Fame. This is the anthem of our generation. Here we are, God, shake our nation. All we need is your love, you Captain Fame Fame. be seated. Good morning. Is my mic on? You can hear me okay? Good deal. I don't know. Is it on? (laughs) Is he awake? (laughs) Good morning. Welcome to Colonel's Alliance. We're really glad that you're here today. I just want to cover a couple things uh, by way of information. Number one, there's an elder in the back who's willing to give you a communion cup if you missed getting one and you're welcome to head back there and he'll make sure you get one. Uh, We want to make sure those are available. Take communion at the end of the service. Um, I also want to mention to you that the Tuesday night men's group um, hasn't had a large contingency. We started that because some guys wanted to be and they couldn't come on Thursdays. But the guys who are coming Tuesdays can come on Thursdays. So we're gonna just combine those. We're meeting on Thursdays and we're at Eric's house these days around the campfire and that's been going really well. Uh, It's been excellent and for food, Uh, We kind of bring something to cook over a fire. We take turns doing that, and there's a fire there, and uh, you can cook that over the fire. We're pretty sure that 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 burns all the germs except maybe the germs from, no, never mind. I'm not going to go there. That takes care of everything. We'll have a good time, though. Um, Also want to mention to you the Board of Ministries will be meeting at uh, 630 on Wednesday, so be aware of that. And the rest of these announcements are all repeat announcements, so I'll let you look at those if you would like. I do want to mention just a couple things that we're praying for. Uh, be praying for Janet's husband, Dick. Um, he uh, had, uh, is having bypass surgery this week, and so remember him in prayer, if you would, please. Somebody asked me for Janet's uh, uh, mailing address uh, to send a card, and I'll put that on, on the e-prayer line. Uh, send out an email if you'd like to do that. Um, pray also for Scott. Scott is recovering well uh, from his surgery, and uh, continue to remember him in prayer as he recovers, if you would. And I'm going to let you read the rest of these requests, uh, if that's okay with you. I would always ask you to pray for those uh, connected with our church family who are adopting. Uh, Remember them because that's often a difficult road. And I want to mention also Milton's sister Sarah uh, had her baby and mother and baby are doing well. There was a lot of complications along the way, but they're coming out of that and moving forward. And so continue to pray for them as they do just that. Okay? We're going to go ahead and worship the Lord with our gifts at this time. And so I'm going to ask those uh, individuals who are serving us by taking the offering if they would come forward at this time. Gentlemen. What's the next slide look like? That's a good idea right there. Good. All right. So Bo and Scott are going to help us with the offering. We'll pray for that in just a moment. Um, And I would remind you that we're not passing offering plates. The ushers will come toward you, and if you're giving, uh, let them know, and uh, they can put that in there. Scott, would you ask God to bless the offering this morning, please? Amen. Now, before the music starts, gentlemen, you may go. Uh, Do what you're going to do. Before the music starts, I do want to point out that my daughter and her family are here. And uh, Brian, do you want to give us any greeting? It's great to have you here. And those are my two grandsons. I don't know if you noticed when the service started that my older grandson wanted to be up there with Grandma. And uh, for some reason, he wasn't allowed to be. I don't understand that. (laughs) All right. Let's continue worshiping the Lord. i 
thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never Good, good father, to you are, to you are, to you are, and I'm loved by you. To who I am, to who I am, to who I am. I've seen many searching for. For and why, but I know we're all searching for answers. You provide, cause you know just what we need before we sing. good, good Father. And you remind us in your word, in the beauty of this day, in the friendships that we have together here at Kerbinsville Alliance, Lord, of your love for us every day. You are so good, Father. And we worship you this morning. And we want to show you that love that you so freely lavish on us that we could never earn and we didn't deserve, but you freely gave it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Just lift his name this morning. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. You are worthy of all of our praise. It's love so
Good morning, everyone. Can you pray with me this morning? Lord, I come to you with a heavy heart when I think about the state of our union, when I think about the challenges that we're facing, whether it be race relations or whether it be this virus that has seemed to turn our everyday life upside down. But I come with, to you, Lord, with a spirit that's willing to accept, that's willing to accept the challenge that you've given to us to be the light on the hill. Lord, we pray this morning that we would be those people that show hope and encouragement throughout our communities, our families, and the world. Because we have that through you, Lord. We know what that is because you have provided that for us. We rely on you for it all, Lord. We praise you in it. I think, Lord, this morning of needs that are a little closer to home, to personal needs that we know about in our community and in our church family. I think of uh, the adoption committee and those that are facing uh, those challenges and hurdles that come with adoption. I pray that you would be in that, amongst that, and they would be able to recognize your presence. I pray for the committee that they would, uh, and I know that they do, seek your will in those things. We thank you for that, Lord. I pray too, Lord, for those that are expecting and ask that you would be with baby and mom and family. I pray and thank you, Lord, this morning for the recovery that Scott is undergoing now for the successful surgery. I pray for Lois Ford and ask that you would be with her and her challenges that he, she has physically. I pray for Andy's aunt, and that you would be with her, that healing would be rapid, and that they would be able to determine everything in the appropriate manner that needs to take place there. I pray to you, Lord, for Linda's son. I pray for Dick this week and the upcoming weeks that he will have with procedures and recovery, and that you would be with him and Janet as well. There's so many needs that are on our list, Lord, and on our heart. I pray that you would be with them all, I thank you, Lord, for being able to come together this morning, whether it be online or in the building. We know that we are gathered together as one, and we lift our praises and our thanks up to you. I ask that you would be with Pastor's sermon this morning, be with us as we are willing to receive it, open our hearts and our minds in a way that you would have it direct us and affect us. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Eric, for uh, remembering those individuals in prayer. Um, I do want to mention to you uh, that I'm really thankful for a number of individuals in our church that have helped us out this week. I wrote some of this down. We know different people are choosing to stay home uh, during this time, and we respect that. We get that completely. And uh, we want to make our Sunday ministry available to them, it's available to you as best we can. And I'm really thankful to Vern, I'm thankful to Dave, I'm thankful to Doug, to Andy, uh, to Drew, um, to uh, Bob, and others who have worked on the streaming. Um, I was about ready to throw up my hands and say I just quit the online streaming in the early service, uh, but we figured it out today, and I got really overwhelmingly positive response from it. The audio is good, it's not buffering like it used to. We're doing better, and so little by little, we're learning. And we do that because, what I just said, we know a number of you are staying home, and we respect that. We get that. And uh, we don't want you to feel like you're not important to our church family, or like we feel you're making a bad choice. We're okay with that. We want you to know you're part of our church family, just as Eric prayed a few moments ago, and we love you. And we are a church family, united together, as we are around the Lord's Supper, around communion. Uh, I'm really thankful for those uh, individuals though, that helped us out uh, both on Friday and then this morning to get things going. Uh, we are really blessed as a church family. I want to ask you if you would, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. We're actually going to read a portion of 11 verses from there in just a moment. And uh, there is, as uh, usual, a Bible app event for this. So if you have your smartphone, 
you can hop onto that and follow along uh, there because a lot of the scripture that you'll need will be uh, at that place. You know, this is Independence Day weekend, the 4th of July, and um, we celebrate, catch that word, celebrate um, our freedom on this day. Uh, a lot of times holidays kind of get lost, like what is Labor Day for again? I can't remember, but nobody forgets what the 4th of July is about. It's about uh, us rebelling against unjust taxation. It's about us um, not wanting to quarter British soldiers in our own property. Uh, things like that, and just wanting to be free to rule ourselves. And so, uh, to celebrate that yesterday, I think I probably had enough pork to last me for the next month. Uh, we had uh, spare ribs barbecued over real charcoal, and then I had a brat, and then I had a brat with bacon, and then I had a brat with some cheese inside it, and I had, I had a, lot of, a lot of good food yesterday. And you celebrated however it was. On the way home from Brookville, coming back to Kermansville, uh, Laurel had mentioned, man, I wish, I'm not going to get to see any fireworks. Wow, was she wrong? Uh, because since we can't gather together all in State College, maybe, or whatever, every, every Pennsylvania hillbilly had their own display going on in their backyard. And thank you, Pennsylvanians, because that was great to watch that on the way home. Celebration is an important part of being human. Jesus was a person who celebrated. Um, you know that his very first, very first miracle was to enhance a celebration. There's a wedding in Cana of Galilee, they run out of wine, and Jesus turns water into wine. Why? Because he was celebrating with these people, this union of this couple. We don't even know their names, but we know that Jesus celebrated. And we see as well Jesus celebrating the feasts. He would go to Jerusalem. You read in the Gospels on the third day of the feast or whatever, you know, this happens and that happens because Jesus is celebrating. He celebrates when victory happens. For example, Jesus sent out his disciples one time, and he sent them out to do ministry. And when they came back, they said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And Jesus' response is, I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven. Now, I want you to know, he didn't say that like this, like, I saw Satan falling like lightning. That wasn't the way he, he did it. He was celebrating. He was full of joy and celebrating. Today we're taking communion, and we call this a celebration of the Lord's death, which might sound kind of strange. We'll talk about that in a short time. Uh, you know, when they were having communion, as they were gathered together in that upper room, Jesus and his 12 followers, the, the apostles, as they were gathered there together, they were celebrating Passover. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want you to look at Matthew 26, I'm going to read 11 verses, starting at verse 20, and we're going to see Jesus celebrating Passover with his disciples. Follow along as I read, if you would. When evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him, one after another, Surely you don't mean me, Lord. Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go as it is written about him, but woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely you don't mean me, Rabbi. Jesus answered, You have said so. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew, when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So Jesus is celebrating Passover with his disciples because celebration is a pattern in God's nature. We've been talking about patterns in God's nature. It is in God's nature to celebrate. In fact, when I think of the seven days of creation, on the seventh day he rested, I think part of that rest involved just celebration because he says, that was good. That was good. A good thing. 
And if you read the word of God, you see over and over again celebration. For example, all the feasts that you read about that Israel was required to engage in, they were required to have a party. They were required to celebrate. For example, the feast of the Passover was celebrating God's protection as they were preparing to leave Egypt. And the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that's celebrating the actual Exodus itself. And the Feast of First Fruits, the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Atonement, the Feast of Tabernacles. All of these things were celebrating things that God had done in the past. It is God's pattern to celebrate and to invite us to participate in that celebration with him. Today, we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Communion itself is a celebratory event. Now, from an outsider's perspective, the Last Supper doesn't look like something to celebrate. I mean, just think about what happened for a moment there. Jesus, again, at that Last Supper, he reminds them that he's about to suffer. You would read that in Luke 22 in verse 15. He says to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Wow, way to be a wet blanket on this party, Jesus. This doesn't feel like much of a celebration if you're talking about suffering. And then in the midst of that, early on in that dinner that they're having together, that celebration dinner, a fight arises among them over who's the greatest. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. You think you had some bad in-laws at your 4th of July celebration? I don't know if they were arguing about who was the greatest. They might have been. If they were, that doesn't feel like much of a celebration, right? And even we read it here that Jesus tells them, one of you is going to betray me. How does that feel celebratory when he says, truly, one of you will betray me? To an outsider, this dinner doesn't feel like it's celebratory, but it is. It's a celebration because of what it is pointing to and what it is teaching them. It is teaching them that this bread of the Passover that they're going to be eating together is really representation of him, Jesus, who is the bread of life. And it represents his body that is going to be crucified for them so they can have life. He tells them that this cup is the new covenant, the new agreement, the new testament, and it's poured out in his blood so that they can be forgiven for their sins, so they can be part of the kingdom, so they can have eternal life. And what he's telling them is that he is purchasing their freedom, freedom from fear of death, freedom from the grip of sin's power, freedom from the domain of Satan himself. And I'll tell you what, if someone tells you, I have freedom for you, I can free you from all your fears, your worst ones, and I can release you from the fear of sin, I mean from the outcome of sin, from the effects of sin, and I can can even promise you victory and give it to you now over Satan himself. That would be something to celebrate. That is a good thing. And so this celebration pattern is seen in the Feast of Israel. It's seen in communion, and it will be seen at the end of time, at the end of the age, in the wedding supper of the Lamb. You know, if you were paying attention, when we read verse 29, Jesus says this kind of odd sentence. At the time, it must have sounded odd. Because he says, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And for you and me, that is a yet future event. That one day we will be at this event called the wedding supper of the Lamb. And the scripture says in Revelation 19, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb because that will be a celebration you will not want to miss. I mean, if you think about it, communion in one respect looks forward to that. But I want to tell you, (laughs) this, see this thing right here? This This is not what we're going to be eating up there, right? This is not what we're going to be drinking up there. The wedding supper of the Lamb is going to have great food, just as Passover had great food. The wedding supper of the Lamb will have great drink, just as as Passover had great drink. But the best part about it, the best part about the wedding supper of the Lamb 
will be Jesus. A, a verse that speaks of God's love for us and the way he sees those who trust in Christ collected together as a body of believers, what we call the church, the Bible calls that the church, it's the people, that, that God sees us as his bride. And in Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 17, it says, The Lord God is with you, a mighty warrior who saves. He will take delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but he will rejoice over you with singing. Can you imagine Jesus singing over you? I can remember when Laurel and I were dating, I was learning to play the guitar. And so I recorded some songs for her. I recorded uh, that Clapton song, you know, You Look Wonderful Tonight, right? On a cassette that, thank God, has been lost through the years, right? She received that, though, the way I intended it. As a beautiful offering and expression of my love for someone I care deeply about, that is what the groom does at the wedding supper of the Lamb. And that will be a celebration to end all celebrations. I can't wait for that moment. We will celebrate, and we do celebrate, what the king has done for us. He has given us freedom from death's tyranny. Freedom from fear of death. Fear of death, by the way, that's a real thing. Listen, as a pastor, I happen to find myself present at the time of death more often than I expected. Do you understand that sentence? I'm there. And, and I just want to say, there's a difference. There's a difference. When you're there with someone whose faith is in Christ and they know Jesus had died for their sins and their home is in heaven, and when you're there with someone who has out and out rejected Jesus, there's a difference. There's a difference. That first person is free from death's tyranny. And whether one wants to admit it or not, um, <laughs> without Christ's death, on our behalf, freeing us. Fear of death is a reality. I mean, just Google fear of death sometime and you'll find all kinds of articles in The Guardian, in Time Magazine, Huffington Post, in Psychology Today, and all of them have pointers on how you can overcome your fear of death. And some of them go so far out on a limb, they even say, check into some religion, maybe that will help you. Wow, <laughs> none of them help. Because none of them give you the one who gives you freedom over death's tyranny, the Lord Jesus Christ. He takes that away. I am not afraid to die. I don't want to get sick. I'm a little bit of a wimp when I'm sick. Just ask Laurel about that, right? I'm kind of one of those high-maintenance sick persons. So I don't want to get sick, but I am not afraid of death. I'm not afraid about being dead. I don't have a death wish or anything, you understand? Though occasionally you might hear me say, stop the world, I want to get off, right? But I don't have a death wish. I'm not in a hurry to die. There are so many ways remaining before me to serve God here. I, I'm enjoying that. And there are people here that I just don't want to say, even see you later to right now. So I don't have any kind of death wish, but I am not afraid of death because Jesus removed the tyranny of death in my life. And I celebrate that. I celebrate at communion freedom from, from sin's power in my life. You see, without Christ, sin has the power to destroy lives. Have you seen that? How many of you have seen, yeah, sin destroyed that person's life? Yeah. Don't you hate putting up your hand? I try not to ask you to do that often. But we do. We see over and over again. Marriage is destroyed. Vocation is destroyed. Business is destroyed. Lives destroyed. Church is destroyed. People destroyed. We see it all the time. And almost always it tra traces right back to sin. And really, without Christ, there's no hope when we do sin. And without Christ, there is no remedy for sin. But Christ and his death, changes that. See, Christ's death takes the victory of sin and death, and it takes it away. 
it takes away the power of sin. In the resurrection chapter, this is 1 Corinthians 15, you read, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, as those who love Jesus, we don't want to sin. Well, sometimes we do sin. And even when we do sin, sin still does not have the final victory to those of us who love Jesus. I say that because of things like what one of Jesus' closest friends, John the Apostle, wrote. He's writing a letter. He's an aged man now by the time he's writing this. It's in 1 John chapter 2. And he's writing to people that he loves like his own little children. In fact, he says to them in verse 1 of chapter 2, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And so at communion, we come to this table and we celebrate the fact that sin does not have the dominion in our life that it once had, leading us to hopelessness and finally to condemnation. Because communion changes all of that. Jesus' death takes that condemnation so that we don't have to. We celebrate freedom from death's tyranny. We celebrate freedom from sin's power. And we celebrate even freedom from Satan's domain. <laughs> you know, we live in a pretty dark world. A world that kind of seems to be under Satan's thumb. Do you understand what I mean by that figure of speech? I want to suggest to you that that's a lie. I want to suggest to you that that's kind of a scam. That Satan has all this power to destroy all of our lives. That's a lie. I was once talking to a manager who had some people under him at various locations throughout the state who were all behaving poorly. Not all of them, but many of them were behaving poorly. So that the business was kind of failing, the corporation was kind of failing. And he said, I just don't know what to do. And I said, can you do anything to make those employees at that location toe the, toe the line? Can you do anything to get them to behave the right way, to do what they're supposed to do as employees? Can you bring maybe some consequences to bear? And listen to what he said. He said, no, my boss has given me no authority whatsoever. And then he said this sentence, listen to it. He said, all I have is the power of bluff. You understand what he means by that? The only way he can implement any power in that person's lives, those people's lives, is to pretend that he has power and for them to believe that he has power that he doesn't really have. Imagine a, a, a manager who has no power except to fake that he has power. He has no power except when he can convince people that he has power that he doesn't really have. That's Satan in the life of a Christian. He has power in this world, in this broken world. He has power in your life if you're not belonging to Jesus, and he exercises that power freely in your life. But his power for those who are believing in Christ is broken. Where do you get that, Pastor Steve? Hmm, from the Bible. <laughs> I, Colossians says it so well in chapter 2. Just listen as I read, starting in verse th 13. When you were dead in your sins and in the circumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Now listen to verse 15. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, that is Satan and his demons, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. That's what we celebrate. We celebrate the fact that the only power Satan has in our lives is that which we give him. And that's a beautiful thing to celebrate a communion. So let's follow that celebratory kind of pattern that God gives us. I mean, I guess I would say to you that if you sense any fear in your life, if you're fearing death or fear, I had a guy say to me one time, 
I'm just really afraid after I die when I stand before the, you know, the judgment seat of Christ. If you have that fear, I want you to release that fear. Talk to God about it. If you have fear about standing before the judgment seat of Christ, deal with that now by confessing whatever sin you're afraid is going to come up there. Because here it is. This is 1 John 1, 9. I just said to someone this week, you should memorize 1 John 1, 9 because it's a great verse. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What in the world do I have to fear? <laughs> Nothing. And so release that residual fear that maybe hangs around in your heart. And maybe make the philosophy of the Apostle Paul your own when it comes to death. We have this saying that we say, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Did you hear that? If I'm away from the body, then I must be with the Lord. And, and we get that from 2 Corinthians 5.8, which says, I say and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. You don't have to be afraid. Release that residual fear. Tell God about it. Ask him to take it away. And second, if you want to celebrate communion and celebrate life in general, relish your freedom from sin. <clears throat> relish the reality that sin no longer has mastery in your life. It says that in Romans chapter 6, for sin shall not be your master because you're not under the law, but under grace. Sure, you sin, but if you're growing in your faith, you're growing in love. And as you grow in love, you will grow in obedience. And you will sin less. You will automatically grow in following Christ more closely as you love him more and more. You know, it doesn't matter how good a person I am. If it, isn't, if it wasn't for Christ, sin would hold elements of mastery in my life. Because without Christ, there is no remedy for sin. And I would have to pay the debt for sin myself. And the price is dear. It is my life. But Christ releases me from that bondage that sin brings toward death. Because he paid the price. And out of gratitude, I don't want to continue to sin. I, I'm dead to sin. Why would I want to live in it anymore? What I want you to hear in this subpoint, relish your freedom from sin, is this. Because of Jesus, sin cannot place a chain around your neck and drag you anywhere, neither toward its goal nor toward your condemnation. He has broken that chain. He has eliminated it. He has taken it away. Relish that. Celebrate that. When you hold this cup in your hand and this element in your hand, say, yeah, Jesus broke the chain. Jesus took that away. And third, resist the devil's lie. Scripture says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. He has the power of bluff and he is good at using it. But that phrase and you've got to be really old to remember this phrase. The devil made me do it. <laughs> that phrase is a lie. The very word devil means liar, accuser, slanderer. Jesus says that when he lies, he's speaking his native language. Why would you believe him? Believe Christ. Believe what has been shown you from Scripture right here and celebrate. That's what we're going to do. We're going to celebrate communion. So the worship team is going to come to the platform. They're going to play a little music and you'll have an opportunity to kind of look into your heart. Look into your heart as you always should and, and kind of just, you guys can come on up when you're ready. Look into your heart as you always should and kind of just... Um, just ask God, is there stuff in my life that I need to do business with you on? If his Holy Spirit says yes, and you know what it is, here it is, then confess it to him. Uh, yeah, guilty. I know I shouldn't have done that. Please forgive me. I hate that I did that. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And then celebrate. 
I mean, don't spend the rest of communion saying, wow, I'm just so guilty, so guilty. Celebrate your release from fear. Relish your freedom from sin's outcome. And resist the lies of the devil as you celebrate the love of God in your life. So let's take that quietness, that moment before God, as the music plays, to just speak to him in communion. And then we'll take communion together. Most of you have used this before. For those who haven't, I want to give you a word of warning. You can really make a mess out of things if you're not careful with this. So there's actually two layers. There's a very thin film. You're going to take that film in a moment, and you're going to pull that film back, and you'll see something about the size of a nickel. And that is the bread that has no resemblance at all to what you will have at the wedding supper of the Lamb. But it symbolizes, it symbolizes the bread of life. So we'll take that after it is exposed. We'll take that together. And then likewise, when you pull the larger, the thicker tab, then you're able to get right to, hey, Chris, pull me down some. Thank you. You'll pull the thicker tab, and you'll have exposed the uh, beverage there. Then, okay? We're going to ask uh, one of the elders if they will pray for the bread uh, beforehand, and that is going to be Eric. Eric, would you pray a prayer of thanksgiving for the body of Christ? Amen. So if you'd like to peel this thin layer, if you'd like to take the element, in a moment we'll take it in unison together. The bread of our Lord Jesus Christ, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us take it. And the scripture says that afterward, he took the cup. Before you open it, we're going to pray a prayer of thanks for it. And I'm going to ask Tim, who's sitting in the back row, Tim, would you ask God, would you express to God our appreciation for the blood of Christ? So now let's open it. That which you hold in your hand represents the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. The blood of Christ. Let's take it together. And you saw that the very last verse we read today said after they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. That's because they didn't have this nice air conditioning that we're in. <laughs> wow, it feels so good in this sanctuary, doesn't it? We're truly blessed. But what really blesses us is the freedom that is given to us by Christ and the celebration we have because of it. I'm going to ask if you would stand and we'll conclude our time in worship. Oh, 
Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling.
Bear your cross as you wait for the crown Tell the world of the treasure you found The benediction I have for you this morning The benediction I have for you this morning comes from Revelation chapter 1. Grace and peace to you from him who is, who was, and who is to come, from the seven spirits before his throne, from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Remember, as you're going to be leaving, an usher will dismiss you from the back, and you can go out the sides. I encourage you to remain in the, uh, in the parking lot and enjoy one another's company out there, maybe catch up with some old friends. God bless you. Oh, come to me.